Welcome to the seminar on the effective use of drift joints in exterior CFS walls. So we're talking about drift joints in exterior cold form steel walls today. So our um, seminar outline, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the code required loading and building movements. Um, however, if, if you're uh, interested, we will do have a much more, I do have a much more in-depth discussion uh, on a webinar that I've done in the past and then also um, we'll be doing it again on September 27th that really gets into the nitty-gritty about um, loading on cold force steel framing and, and specifically the connections back to the base structure. So you're welcome to um, either find the recording on um, our SKGA website or um, listen in at the end of September. We're going to talk about the what and the why of drift joints typical drift joint details, uh, facade finishes and drift joints, and then discontinuities at drift joints. So the loading. As with any um, system, there is we have to look at dead load, live load, wind load, and seismic load. Now in general, the dead load on a wall is its self-weight, uh, and then in general, we are looking at the exterior walls as being non-bearing, especially if you're putting drift joints in. It's pretty much impossible to make them bearing. However, um, if, you are, if you don't release somehow to take out the vertical deflections, you could end up with bearing walls. And that's when your dead load or live load um, would be an applicable loading condition. Uh, but in general, you're detailing exterior facades to be non-bearing, so that's not usually an issue. Then we, of course, have to deal with wind and then um, seismic, at least for uh, those of us uh, in seismic country. Um, we have to deal with, with the seismic loads. So wind loading, um, just a real overview. Uh, it's the International Building Code, which references ASC 7-10, Chapter 30. We use the component in cladding loading, not the main wind force resisting system loading when you're looking at walls. Um, your corner wind pressures are higher. So when you're designing an exterior uh, facade wall, sometimes that higher pressure will give you a significant enough stud size increase that you'll want to have two different stud sizes called out, one for corners, one for the main wall. Uh, if you do do that, it's important to clearly identify those corner locations on your drawings so that the contractor um, can install those correctly. Um, the loads do decrease with the increased tributary area. So for a wall stud, the code actually allows you to take the length uh, times a third of the length to, um, as your tributary area. However, for your connectors, let's say top and bottom or at a slab edge, uh, your tributary area really is only that stud, whatever spacing um, the anchors are at. So that's something to be careful of as you're running your numbers. And then in general, suction loads, so the wind suction loads uh, govern over the pressure side loads. So basically wind load is typically constant over the height, meaning that the wind load you design your first story walls for is the same as you design your top story. Uh, your parapet loading, as you can see, you're getting pressure or suction on the main side and also the back side, so your loads get pretty high. Uh, seismic loading, uh, ASCE 710 Chapter 13, as I'm sure those of you are aware. Um, Non-structural component loads, F sub P loads. Remember that um, they do increase with height, so the higher you up are on the building, the uh, higher the forces are. And then also your fastener level loads for exterior walls are higher because your R sub P value is one. Um, and so your, and your A sub P value is different too. So your fastener level loads are higher on your connectors than on your um, wall framing. So that's something to keep in mind. And we go, I go into that a lot of detail um, when we talk about the design of the exterior connectors. So for seismic loading, um, performance requirements. So beyond just the ability of the framing and its attachments to take the code prescribed loads, that's pretty clear. But does the code have performance requirements? And basically it doesn't have performance requirements, meaning it doesn't say that your you know, exterior finish has to remain, um, can't crack or can't have damage. The only thing it basically says is that the framing can't fall from the building. So on a glazing system, there's a bit more of specific uh, rules about glazing not cracking. Uh, that makes sense, but for um, exterior walls, there isn't. Now, some projects, um, especially as we move more and more into 
this um, world of resiliency-based design are having uh, project-specific either loading. Um, so I've seen this from time to time when a building has a um, uh, has, has done a modal analysis where they will actually report the accelerations that you're supposed to design the non-structural components to. Uh, there's a code, there's an FCP equation that is right after the other FCP equations where you take, it's called an AI value, 